It is my very great pleasure to introduce a scientist, an astronomer, a woman who is at UWM. Uh, she works at the Center for Gravitation, Cosmology and Astrophysics. She is an expert in galaxies and she will share with us what she knows about this fascinating topic. Um, I will just for a moment uh, ask Victoria to give us some uh, suggestions about how to handle questions that people might have during the program. And um, so Victoria, take it away. Yeah, so um, we're in a Zoom webinar. So um, if you have questions that you think of while Don is talking, um, we invite you to put them in the Q&A. So there's a little button that should appear at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, it says Q&A, so you click on that and that's where you would type your question if you think of one, um, instead of the, the chat box, which is a different place. The Q&A just helps us uh, track everyone's questions a little better. So, and we will, we will um, go through the Q&A mostly through uh, at the end of um, the program after Don's talk, but uh, if something really pertinent comes up, we might uh, address it during the talk as well. Yeah, great. So um, Don, go ahead. All right, thank you, Jean. I'm very happy to be here to talk to you all about one of my favorite topics, which mm -hmm. is the care and feeding of galaxies. And what I really mean by that is how galaxies form and evolve and how all of this is influenced by their environment on very large scales. So if you think of a galaxy and have a picture of a galaxy in your mind, it probably looks something like this. This is the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest large neighbor galaxy, which is of course a beautiful galaxy. But what I hope to show you over the course of this talk is that your mental picture of a galaxy should maybe look a little bit more like something like this. So this is a very dynamic system. We've got our galaxy and its stars in the center there, but then we also have all of these flows of gas going in and out of the galaxy. So we're gonna talk about this whole galactic ecosystem today, and also about some of the instruments, in particular, the new technologies that we're using to study this and in particular, a new instrument on the Keck telescope in Hawaii, which I've been using to try to understand a few things about how these galaxies interact with their environment. So here is the plan for our evening. I'm going to start with just some basics of galaxies so that we're all on the same page and know what a galaxy is. And then I'll talk a little bit about how galaxies have changed over time and how they're distributed in space. That will bring us to how galaxies grow and evolve in their larger environment. And then finally, we'll talk about these new technologies that are giving us new ways to map the environments of galaxies to learn how they evolve. And that will finally lead us to this concept of this whole galactic ecosystem, this dynamic system where galaxies are interacting with their environment. So let's start at the beginning. What is a galaxy? Here is a, another beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of a relatively nearby spiral galaxy. You can see it has this lovely spiral structure. But Let's go through the components here. So a galaxy is a large collection of stars, gas, and dark matter bound together by gravity. So let's talk about those three things just briefly. Stars are very big, dense balls of gas, hydrogen, and a little bit of helium powered by nuclear fusion going on at their centers. So gas in galaxies, mostly hydrogen gas. And this gas is how we get stars. Stars form when galaxies collapse due to gravity and become dense enough to turn into stars. And then finally, there is dark matter. 
This is invisible. We can tell that it's there because of its gravitational effects. And we know that it makes up most of the mass of galaxies, something like 95%, but we don't know what this is. This is a big mystery in astrophysics today. It is most of the mass in galaxies and most of the mass in the universe. So we'll be coming back to that. Just a few more pretty pictures of galaxies. This is a spiral galaxy called UGC 12158, which is not a particularly fancy name, but this particular galaxy is interesting because this is what we think our Milky Way galaxy probably looks like, a spiral galaxy with that bar structure that you see in the center there. We classify galaxies in the nearby universe into various types. So we have spiral galaxies like you see here. We have elliptical galaxies, which have very smooth distributions of stars, relatively featureless. These tend to be old stars. We also have little funny looking galaxies, which we call irregular galaxies, which is what you see on the right here, on the left, there just happens to be a very bright star that's also in this image. But this is a small, funny shaped galaxy that we just call irregular. That's our catch all category for things that aren't spirals or ellipticals. But again, let's expand our mental pictures of galaxies a little bit. I mentioned that galaxies are mostly dark matter. So, all those stars and that pretty spiral that you see is really only the very central portions of a galaxy. It extends out much, much further with what we call a dark matter halo. So this is a roughly spherical distribution that contains most of the mass of the galaxy. We can tell that it's there, but we don't know what it is. It's probably some kind of subatomic particle. There are, of course, billions of galaxies in the universe. This is a famous image called the Hubble Deep Field, where the Hubble Space Telescope pointed for a long time at a seemingly empty patch of sky. And it turned out to be filled with galaxies. And in fact, there are four stars in this image. Everything else is a galaxy. So let's just draw some circles. Those are the stars. You can identify them because they have those little spikes on them. Everything else is a galaxy and most of them are very far away. Let's zoom in on a galaxy for just a little bit now. Galaxies, of course, are where stars form. So this is a star forming region in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a small satellite galaxy of our Milky Way. This is a region called 30 Doradus, which is one of the most active star forming regions that we know about. So what we have here is clouds of gas that are condensing and collapsing. They become dense enough so that nuclear fusion can start. And that is when a star is born. The star lives until it runs out of fuel for fusion and then it dies, returning gas and energy to its surroundings. And we'll talk a little bit more later on about the impact of this process on the galaxy, which might be larger than you expect. The rate of star formation in galaxies has also changed quite a bit over time. The universe is about 14 billion years old. And this little diagram here is just showing you a little schematic of, of the star formation in galaxies over time. So we are over there on the left. It's been about 14 billion years since the Big Bang. There are stars forming in galaxies, but not at a super high rate. And if we go back in time, we can see that the galaxies are forming more and more stars. And astronomy is actually very convenient. There aren't very many sciences where you can actually look back in time, but we can do that because we are looking at things that are so far away that it takes light 
billions and billions of years to get to us. So the galaxies that I like to study are the ones that live up here. This is when the star formation in the universe was at its peak, galaxies were most active, and this is a time about 11 billion years ago. So it took about 11 billion years for the light from those galaxies to get to us today. Now I showed you lots of pretty pictures of nearby spiral and elliptical galaxies. These galaxies that I like to study look something, <laughs> excuse me, a bit more like this. These are a little bit less beautiful and dramatic. If you remember that irregular galaxy that I showed you as well, most of these galaxies look sort of like that irregular galaxy. Plus we've moved them many, many billions of light years away. So it's much harder to take pretty detailed pictures of them. These you can think of as baby galaxies, galaxies in the early universe that are still growing into the big spiral and elliptical galaxies that we see today. So that is galaxies over time. Let's talk now a bit about the distribution of galaxies in space. This is a map of our galactic neighborhood. You are right there at the center. And those two pie-shaped things are little wedges of the sky. This is data from a very large survey of galaxies. And every single dot, single yellow dot on these plots is a galaxy. So what you can see from this, there's a little scale on the bottom there to help you in billions of light years. So this is a pretty large piece of the universe, although it still doesn't go remotely as far as those little galaxies that I showed you earlier. These galaxies are not distributed randomly. There is structure in this diagram. You can see lines of galaxies, which we call filaments. There are empty spaces in between them, which we call voids. And all of this makes up the large scale structure of the universe. Here's another picture, which you might recognize this one. This is not of galaxies. This is, of course, a picture of the United States taken at night. And you can see lots of light here, but you understand what this is actually showing you. All those lights are cities. So the lights are revealing where the people are. It's telling you the greatest concentrations of people. And you can think of galaxies in a similar way. They are revealing where most of the matter in the universe is. They're revealing concentrations of dark matter. So if we look at a map of the universe, it might look something like this. We can see that filamentary structure that we saw in that survey of galaxies, but there's a web underneath it of dark matter, which is invisible, connecting all of these galaxies along filaments with the largest and brightest galaxies at these nodes where these filaments intersect. This is something that we call the cosmic web. This is the large scale structure of the universe. And this is something that we study through giant computer simulations. I'll show you a movie from one of these simulations very shortly, but we'll start just with this still. This is from something called the Millennium XXL simulation, a giant supercomputer simulation of the growth of this structure in the universe. And if you go to this, if you go to this address down here or Google it or whatever you wanna do, there's actually a little browser where you can explore this structure and zoom in and zoom out, and it's pretty cool. But let's talk about how this structure forms. I'm gonna show you a movie next from another cosmological simulation, something called the Aquarius Project. And this is going to show you 
the growth of the dark matter halo containing a galaxy like the Milky Way condensed into about a minute. So this starts with some changes that will seem a little bit subtle. We start with a pretty very smooth distribution of matter. And if you watch this, you can see that filamentary structure starting to develop. And this is all happening because of gravity. We start out with a very smooth distribution of mass in the universe. But if there are some regions that are just slightly more dense than other regions, they have a slightly stronger gravitational pull. And that means that they can pull more and more matter into them. And that means that regions become more and more dense, empty regions become more and more empty, and we eventually develop this large scale structure just from the condensing effects of gravity. And something like the Milky Way would be forming near the center of this image. So what we learn from these simulations of dark matter and gravity is that galaxies grow by merging with other galaxies. This is the basic model for how galaxies form and evolve. They condense from slightly overdense regions of dark matter, they pull in gas, they get bigger and bigger, and then small galaxies merge with other small galaxies to form slightly bigger galaxies which continue to merge until we eventually get to the large galaxies that we have around us today. And we know that this process is happening. We can see this, we see galaxies merging. Here is another picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of a pair of galaxies in the process of merging. This is a big galactic collision, you can see these long tails of debris going off on either side, these are ripped out of the galaxies by the collision process. Here's another similar picture of how this works. Again, we have two galaxies colliding together. They will probably eventually in billions of years settle down into a single galaxy, probably an elliptical galaxy. But in the meantime, they go through this dramatic collision which can also trigger new stars forming in the galaxy, because if there's gas in those galaxies, that gas can collide and that can cause it to collapse and form more stars. So we know from all of this that galaxies are dynamic. They are not just collections of stars sitting there in space, not doing anything. They interact with other galaxies and with their environment. This is a still from another computer simulation that models this process, something called the Illustra simulation. I'm going to show you a movie from this simulation very shortly. And this is different than the previous movie that I showed you because the previous movie was just dark matter. So it was just showing you the structure in this invisible stuff that we can't actually see. But this new movie also incorporates stars and gas. So we're going to start out with a view of that cosmic web sort of structure, but then you can see the effects of star formation in galaxies. So here's our cosmic web structure. You can see the galaxies at the densest points in the web. But now pay attention to the changes that are happening here much more quickly. We can start to see flashes and explosions. And there is a lot going on in these galaxies. The color scale here is showing you the temperature of the gas. So there is a lot going on here. We have gas that is being heated up and seems to be exploding out of these galaxies. So what is going on here? What we are looking at is galaxies 
that are starburst galaxies, what we call starburst galaxies. These are galaxies that have very intense star formation, star formation that is so intense that they can actually blow some of their gas all the way out of the galaxy completely. This picture here is a Hubble Space Telescope picture of a galaxy called M82, which is a very nearby galaxy. It is our poster child for this sort of galaxy. You can see in the bluish color, a fairly ordinary looking disk galaxy, but then the red on the top is an image taken of hydrogen gas that is being blown out of the galaxy due to intense and concentrated star formation in the center. And the reason for this goes back to that process of star formation and evolution and death that we talked about earlier. So the most massive stars, they go th through their lives, they fuse hydrogen into helium, and then they start fusing heavier and heavier elements in their core. But at some point, they will run out of fuel, they can no longer support themselves, and these incredibly massive stars explode suddenly and catastrophically in something that we could call a supernova. So this was an animation of that process that you just saw here. And these explosions drive all kinds of energy into the gas that surrounds them in galaxies. And this ends up having a big effect on the galaxies themselves. In fact, this drives something that we call a galactic super wind. So here we have another movie from another simulation of how this process works. You can again see a bit of the large scale structure, but the, all the stuff that's going on here is the gas. So there are stars forming and exploding at the center of this galaxy. And this is having an incredibly dramatic effect on the gas in the galaxy. It is being heated up to extremely high temperatures and it is is being blown out of the galaxy altogether. So this is a very dramatic and violent and dynamic process. And I think we can see a little hint of that if we go back to our galaxy M82 here. This is the same galaxy that we looked at before, just a different image. So this is now a composite picture taken from light at a bunch of different wavelengths. So we have x-rays, which are the blue, the dark blue coming out on either side. That is showing you the very hottest gas that's being blown out of the galaxy by those exploding stars. And then we also have visible and infrared light where you can see the red light also coming from hydrogen gas in the outflows and then the stars in the galaxy in that sort of yellow green color. So this has a dramatic effect on star formation in galaxies. Something like this is where stars form. This is a small and turbulent star forming region in our own galaxy. These are pillars of very dense gas where stars are forming. And if we look at a star forming region at a slightly later phase of evolution, you can start to see something like this. You can start to see these shocks and empty regions where the effect of stars has, is starting to blow the gas away and out of the galaxy. So these galactic superwinds have a profound effect on the evolution of galaxies. They limit and regulate star formation in galaxies by heating up and expelling gas. In order to form new stars, we need there to be gas and it needs to be cold. But if we explode lots of supernovae, we will heat up and expel a bunch of gas and that 
limits the amount of stars that can form. Galaxies are actually not very efficient at forming stars, and this is probably why. In our nearby local universe, galaxies like this are relatively rare. But if we again go back and look at my favorite galaxies about 11 billion years ago, it turns out that most galaxies were starburst galaxies. Most galaxies are driving these super winds of gas out of the galaxies altogether. And that is directly related to this rate of star formation in galaxies that's shown by our schematic blue line here. The more star formation you have, in particular, the more concentrated and intense star formation you have, the more likely your galaxy will be able to drive a starburst. So all of this is good. We've learned that galaxies contain stars and gas and dark matter. They are dynamic. Those clouds of gas are collapsing to form stars. The evolution of those stars drives a bunch of energy into the gas, which can drive it out of the galaxy altogether. But we're still missing one part of all of our galactic evolution here, and that is the basic fuel for all of this. We need to be able to continually fuel this star formation and outflows of gas by the inflow of new gas. This is very important. The reason why I've left it to the end here, and I'm not saying too much about it, is that this is a much more difficult process to detect. I'm gonna talk a bit about the various tools that we use to study these things in a little bit. And we'll see that this accretion of new gas is much trickier to detect than the other processes that we've talked about so far. What you're seeing here is just an artist's conception. We have a galaxy with these streams of gas flowing in. And what this is trying to convey is actually a model of how galaxies accrete new gas. And the idea is that we actually have gas flowing into galaxies along these filaments in the cosmic web-like structure that the galaxies are embedded in. So we're gonna come back to that very soon. But first, let's talk a little bit about the tools and technologies that we use to study and learn this stuff. What you're looking at here is a very pretty picture of the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii at night, where there are many astronomical telescopes. Those two round domes on the right are the twin domes of the Keck Observatory. These are the telescopes that I like to use. And most of the data that I work with to study these things comes from those telescopes. So what I've shown you so far is a lot of pretty pictures. And we can certainly learn a lot from images of galaxies. But what we really want to get much more detailed information about what is actually happening in a galaxy is a spectrum. So that just means that we look at the galaxy with something called a spectrograph and we take the light and spread it all out according to its wavelength, which in the visible range is just spreading it out by color like in a rainbow. So what you're seeing here is a spectrum of a particular galaxy. In fact, it's one that I spent a little while studying. You can see a number of features here. There are a couple of black circles that are showing little dips in the spectrum, those we call absorption lines. There are some gray circles showing you peaks in the spectrum, which we call emission lines. 
These features are coming from the stars and the gas in the galaxy. And by analyzing them, we learn all sorts of things. We learn about the types and ages of stars. We learn about the chemical composition of the gas. We can even learn about the velocities of the flows in the, of the gas in the galaxy by looking at very slight wavelength shifts of those lines. You'll also see a very big line off on the left there. That line is very important, and we're going to talk more about that very, very soon. But first, there is a new instrument on the Keck telescope. It was installed just a few years ago now. And this is something called the Keck Cosmic Web Imager. I introduced you to the cosmic web earlier, this whole web-like structure in which galaxies are embedded. So you can tell from the name of this new instrument that it is trying to image and explore this distant large-scale structure. And this instrument uses a technique called integral field spectroscopy, which this cube here is attempting to illustrate. If you look at a galaxy with an integral field spectrograph, you get what we call a data cube. So you've got two axes of position and a third axis going where that rainbow is of wavelength. So what does that actually mean? One way that you can think about this is that your data cube contains images of your galaxy at any particular wavelength of light that you're interested in. So suppose we look at this galaxy here with our integral field spectrograph. Our data cube contains images of this galaxy at every wavelength of light. So we can step through and make what are called little narrow band images of our galaxy at different wavelengths of light to see what it looks like. But we can also, and even more powerfully, look at this in a slightly different way. So we have now three little squares on the images of our galaxy. Those just re represent pixels in the image. And we can slice through this cube. And what we get using this technique is a spectrum of every pixel. So we can have an image at every wavelength, or we can have a spectrum at every spatial position from our data cube. So this is a very powerful technique. This is giving us all sorts of new information. And this Keck Cosmic Web Imager in particular is designed to be very, very sensitive so we can get this kind of information from stuff that is very faint. So these spectra that you're looking at right here, you will probably notice that there is one very strong and dominant feature. And that feature is emission from hydrogen gas. This is a particular spectral feature that we call Lyman alpha emission. So what is going on here is that we have hot, massive stars in galaxies. Those galaxies ionize their surrounding hydrogen gas. They rip those electrons away from their protons. They then combine back again, get ripped back and forth, go through this whole process of ionization and recombination. And that process produces light at a particular wavelength in the ultraviolet that we call Lyman alpha emission. And these Lyman alpha photons, photons are just particles of light. These are important because they leave those ionized regions where they're born and they can then light up the hydrogen gas in and around galaxies. So this is how that works. On the right here, we have a little schematic of a hydrogen atom. There is a proton with an electron around it. 
that other dotted line is another possible energy state for that electron. And if one of these Lyman alpha photons comes along, the electron can absorb it and that will bump it up to a higher energy state, but it's not gonna stay there. It will fall back down to a lower energy state. And when it does, it will re-emit that photon. And that emitted photon carries a memory of the atom that scattered it. It will emerge from where that atom is, no matter where it is in the galaxy, and it will have a small shift in wavelength because of the velocity of that atom. And that's why this emission line on the left has that double peaked structure. You can see that it has a strong peak on the right, which is slightly redder light, and a smaller peak on the left, slightly bluer light. That is because of this whole process of these Lyman alpha photons being absorbed and re-emitted by gas in the galaxy. So if we look at a galaxy in the early universe, almost any galaxy, it turns out, in the light of this Lyman alpha emission, what we see is that the stars are surrounded by a much larger halo of hydrogen gas that is glowing in this light of Lyman alpha. So here is an artistic representation of that, a little irregular star forming galaxy in the center, surrounded by a much larger halo of gas glowing in Lyman alpha emission that we study using this cosmic web imager that lets us not only make an image at the wavelength of Lyman alpha, but measure that spectrum as well. So we can measure the structure of that emission line at all of those different points in the halo. And the interpretation of this all gets a little bit complicated and technical, so I don't wanna go into too many details. The main thing that you need to know is that there are two different scenarios for our double peaked lines. The one you see on the left, that red peak on the right is stronger than the peak on the left, which is bluer light. And that is what you get when gas is flowing out of a galaxy. This is what we almost always see. And this is how we know that most of these galaxies in the early universe are these starburst galaxies with strong outflowing clouds of gas. We can see it by studying the profile of this Lyman alpha emission. And now with this new instrument, we can even start to do this at different locations in the halo around the galaxy to try to understand what's going on in more detail. What you see on the right here is a much more unusual scenario. Now you can see the peak on the left is stronger than the one on the right. And you can think of that as just sort of flipping things around. Instead of gas flowing out, we have gas flowing in. So we do see this occasionally, but this is much more rare. And this is probably a sign of those rare accretion events may be coming in along those narrow streams that are much harder to detect. The last thing that I want to tell you about today is putting all of this together. And this is a project that I'm working on here at UWM with a student, Claire Bolda, who is an undergrad here at UWM. Claire is working with me to study galaxies in a region of the early universe, which is shown here in this picture. So we'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but you're looking at an image of a patch of sky and everything you see marked with a square or a circle or a star is some sort of galaxy or other object at this particular distance of 11, when the universe was 11 billion years younger than it is now. 
And you'll have to trust me on this when I tell you that this is a very dense distribution of galaxies. This is, in fact, what we call a proto-cluster. What that means is that this is a dense region of galaxies that we think is eventually going to evolve into something like this. This is a nearby galaxy cluster called Abel 1689. Galaxy clusters are large groups of galaxies bound together by gravity. They are the most massive gravitationally bound objects in the universe. So this region that we're studying in the very early in the early universe is something that we think is eventually going to evolve into a cluster like this. But let's go back to our image here of our particular region of space. You can see various things marked on this image. We'll start with those green stars. They, I'm not sure how well they'll show up on your screen, so I will highlight them for you. These green stars are indicating something that we give the highly technical name of Lyman alpha blobs to. These are very large extended regions of that Lyman alpha emission. So I showed you a picture of my little galaxy with this halo around it. These are much bigger. So very large regions of this Lyman alpha emission. We're still not entirely sure of the causes of these things. There are probably a few galaxies in these that are lighting up all of that gas. But you might also notice something else interesting here, and that is that these blobs are in a couple of lines. We can draw lines, two lines through these blobs, and we find that they lie along what we can think of as filaments that intersect at the locations of one of them. So hopefully this is starting to be reminiscent of that filamentary structure of the cosmic web that I showed you earlier. You might notice some other hints of structure in this image. If we look at the red circles now, there are two different types of galaxies shown here and the ones marked in red circles are the more massive, larger galaxies in this proto cluster. And those also tend to fall on a couple of lines. There's a line that's more or less parallel to one of those filaments defined by the blobs. And then there's another line that gives us a triangle. So what are we doing here? What we are actually doing, Claire and I, is looking at two galaxies in this whole structure. That little inset is an image from the Keck Cosmic Web Imager of these big extended Lyman alpha halos around two of the galaxies in this proto-cluster structure. So these galaxies have those big extended halos being lit up by those Lyman alpha photons. And what you might notice, and what I will point out, is that those halos are a little bit elongated. There's some dashed lines in that image there, which are more or less aligned both with the Lyman alpha emission in our galactic halo and with that larger scale filament. So it seems that the gas surrounding these galaxies that we're seeing in Lyman alpha knows about that larger scale structure in our protocluster and this filament of the cosmic web that it seems to be embedded in. And we have more information because we're using this great technique of integral field spectroscopy. We also have spectra of these Lyman alpha lines. And this is showing you just one of them. 
And this is one of those unusual cases where that peak on the left is just about as strong as the peak on the right, which is a signature of inflowing gas, which again is pretty rare. This is not what we usually see. So what we think we're seeing here is hints of this elusive scenario of gas flowing into galaxies along these filaments. So stay tuned for this. Claire is studying this spatially extended emission and its spectra from these two galaxies to learn about how they're interacting with their environment. And hopefully we'll be writing up a paper on this sometime in the next year or so, which will be very exciting. All right. So I'm going to wrap up with a summary of what I like to call this galactic ecosystem. So we're starting with the picture of a galaxy that maybe you had when we started this, a bunch of stars sparkling sitting there in space. But we now know that we need to add a whole lot of other things to this model. These stars are embedded in a much larger halo of dark matter that makes up most of the mass of the galaxy and most of the mass of the universe. And that halo is filled with gas, which we can see because it's lit up by these photons of that particular Lyman alpha wavelength. And not only that, this gas is dynamic. We have outflows of gas driven by star formation and supernovae in the galaxy. We have gas flowing in, which fuels these outflows and new star formation and is probably coming in on those filaments of the cosmic web. And all of this is embedded in this large scale structure of the universe. So I hope I've convinced you that a galaxy is much more than its stars. It is a dynamic and changing ecosystem of gas and dark matter as well as stars. And it's embedded in this cosmic web of large scale structure in the universe. And because of new technologies, we are starting to be able to reveal the structure of this web and see how it interacts with galaxies and influences their evolution. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Don. This was great. Victoria? Yeah, so while we let people collect their thoughts, um, we did have one question come in from Mila. Myla. Myla. Uh, the question Myla. is, why do, you, Myla. Yeah, Myla, <laughs> uh, why do the galaxies have different colors? Myla, hi Myla, that is an excellent question. And the answer is that galaxies contain stars of different ages. So very young stars, at least the most massive stars, which live very short lifetimes are very blue. So a galaxy that is forming lots of stars will be blue because it contains these very blue stars that are very hot and die very quickly. If you look at a galaxy that's much older, all of those blue stars will have exploded and died and they'll be gone. And the only stars that will be left are the much smaller stars which live a long time and they are red. They're red because they're cooler. So the color of a galaxy is really telling you about the type of stars that it contains and how old they are. And Heidi says, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, Heidi. So Mary, Mary has a question, which is what did the blue squares represent on the image of the undergraduates project? Yes, let's just go back to those blue squares. So we have two different ways that we've selected galaxies in this protocluster, two different ways that we identified them. 
the ones with the red circles are identified basically via their colors in images taken in different filters, which lets us pick out galaxies, star forming galaxies at a particular range of distances. Those blue squares are actually taken from a technique that we call narrow band imaging. So this is somewhat related to the integral field spectroscopy. It's basically just taking an image, but then you put a filter on your camera that just captures a very narrow wavelength of light. And that particular wavelength in this case is tuned to Lyman alpha emission at the redshift of this cluster. So the universe is expanding, that causes the wavelengths of the light to be shifted to the red, the farther away something is. So we can also select galaxies by imaging that emission line at the particular wavelength where it falls based on the redshift of the cluster, based on its particular distance. And the galaxies that we find this way tend to be smaller, lower mass sorts of things, which is probably why they're not quite as clustered into filaments as the ones that are marked with the red circles. So hopefully that answers your question. We have lots of other questions coming in. Um, I just wanna do a plug really quick for um, a virtual stargazing have going on at eight. Uh, so in eight minutes, um, in case anyone is interested in checking that out, um, but we'll continue here as well. So the virtual stargazing is on a platform called Topia. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, so normally when we have cooperative weather, we would have a live virtual live feed from different telescopes throughout uh, Wisconsin, including our own at the planetarium, but also um, observatories in Madison, as well as I think um, Yerkes. Uh, unfortunately, the weather isn't cooperating tonight, um, but we will still hold the event. And if anyone wants to check out the Topia platform, um, you can get kind of like a sneak preview to see what, what it looks like. Uh, it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting virtual platform you kind of, you get like a little avatar and you can walk around and I don't know, it's fun. I'll put the link in there in case anyone wants to check that out at 8 p.m. Um, so our next question is from Tonya, what effect will the James Webb Telescope have on your research, if any? Yeah, that's a great question. So hopefully all of you saw in the news, the next generation space telescope was just launched on Christmas day and it is, out there now trying to focus all its mirrors. And it will be great at studying these galaxies in the early universe, which has to do with this whole concept of redshift that I was just discussing. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to study infrared light. So that's light with slightly longer wavelengths. And when galaxies are very, very far away, a lot of their light is shifted into those infrared wavelengths. So the James Webb Space Telescope will give us much more detailed information about some aspects of these galaxies. It will let us look at much fainter galaxies, get spectra like the ones that I've showed you here, things that will let us measure their chemical composition, all sorts of, a lot of things similar to what I've been showing you, but in more detail. So there should be a lot of exciting things coming out from that in the next couple of years. Okay, another question. Why do some galaxies show as spirals that are so clear to see versus a uh, cluster? So, I'm not sure I know what you mean by spirals versus cluster, but there are the question of what causes spiral structure in galaxies is still actually an area of active research. 
galaxies that are spiral galaxies have regular disks that are rotating. So to be a spiral galaxy, a galaxy probably hasn't undergone giant mergers with other galaxies that would have messed up that disk-like structure. And those spiral arms themselves are sort of like traffic jams of stars, places where the stars get bunched up together as the whole galaxy rotates. So it basically has to do with the history of the galaxy and the orbits of the stars. If all of those things are nice and smooth, we might end up with well-defined spiral arms. If the galaxy has gone through lots of other mergers, we might end up with a more funny elliptical galaxy. If the galaxy has lots of star formation going on, that's usually when you will see more prominent clumps and clusters and things like that. So hopefully that helps at least a little bit. Okay, a question from Jerry. Is it possible that the inflow of gases is being caused by a black hole or is it more akin to a jet stream? The inflow of gas is probably just coming from gravity. So there is gas out there in what we call the intergalactic medium that there's gas associated with all of those filaments and it's probably just being pulled into galaxies by gravity. A lot of these galaxies probably do have supermassive black holes at their center, but it turns out that in most cases, the region that those black holes can influence is actually pretty small. So they can pull in gas from their immediate neighborhood, but they don't have nearly enough gravity to pull in gas from much further away. That's just coming due to the gravity of the entire galaxy and its dark matter halo. Okay, and a question from Deborah. What do scientists guess all the dark matter is exactly? <laughs> that is a good question. There are lots of guesses. I think probably the most common scenario is that, so this is probably some type of subatomic particle that doesn't like to interact very much with other particles. So it's really a question of particle physics. Particle physicists are the ones trying to figure this out with dark matter detectors and things. There's a class of thing called a WIMP that stands for weakly interacting massive particle. That's just a name for sub, some subatomic thing that doesn't like to interact with other particles very much. So there are a lot of theories about what sort of particle this might actually be. There are a lot of detectors that people have built to try to catch signatures from these particles. We don't have any smoking gun detections yet, so this still isn't solved, but something like that is the leading theory. Well, I think we got to the end of our question list. Um, I am going to head over to the Topia thing but I can assign Jean as the host if you see any other questions come in, or maybe you have some other questions of your own, Jean. I can't resist. Um, you showed a picture of lots of your baby galaxies. I was yeah. hoping that you could talk to us about your favorite baby galaxy. Oh, well, let's see. I don't know if my favorite baby choose? galaxy. <laughs> I do have a favorite baby galaxy, but I don't know if it's in that image. Let me see if I can find my image of all of the galaxies. Let's see. Yeah, so my favorite baby galaxy is not actually in this image. It is, however, the one that is illustrated in the artist conception here by our local artist, Tonya Klein. This was an image that was actually illustrating a press release that came out about some results from the Cosmic Web Imager about my favorite galaxy, which has the great name of Q2343BX418. 
It is a young baby galaxy with very strong Lyman alpha emission and other interesting emission lines, which is giving us a good view of galaxies in the early stages of evolution. So that's my favorite galaxy. Its picture is not very dramatic. It's a little small blob. Right. Which is why an artist is required to spruce it up a little bit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, um, we don't have other questions. Um, I will ask then if you, well, I mean, we're dreamers. We, we need to be dreamers uh, at this point in time. Um, what would be kind of the next upping the ante in terms of instrumentation for your needs? Yeah, so what I would really love to see is, so there's one of the future space telescope concepts, which is probably not going to happen, at least in its full scope, because it's so giant and expensive, is something called Louvoir, which stands for, uh, what's the L for? UV optical and infrared telescope. But this is, sort of like the Hubble Space Telescope, except much, much bigger. The original concept was for a 15 meter diameter mirror, which I'm sure is not gonna happen. It would be colossally expensive. What I want is KWI in space. So the advantage of doing studies like this from space is that the atmosphere is not in the way and that gives you much, much finer spatial resolution and greater sensitivity so then you could start to make these maps in a lot more detail. So then I think if we had that, we would not only see more details in these individual halos, but we would actually be able to really see the structure of this cosmic web as well. So that would be cool. We'll keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll get something like that. Okay, um, I'm uh, going to uh, wrap this up. I would like to thank you again, Don, for uh, giving this wonderfully interesting but accessible also um, presentation. It is, after all, a month to celebrate women, and we're very proud of your role as um, as a professional astronomer and a full professor at UWM. So thank you again for taking the time and for putting together a, a very interesting uh, presentation. All right, well, thank you, Jean. I enjoyed it and thank you to everyone for listening.